welcome to Journey. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be with you today. My prayer is that the music and the message and really all of the moments of our time together help draw you closer to God and help you see today that God is good. Let me give a big shout out to our Lake County campus. Uh, love having you guys join us and all of you who are watching us online. We are, we're thrilled that you're here as well. I want to tell you two stories as we begin, and I want to see if you can find the common theme between these two stories. What's the common denominator that's going to tie these two stories that I'm going to tell you together? And here's the first story. It's a shocking parable, actually, from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus describes what the kingdom of heaven is really all about, the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And so it goes like this. There was once a wealthy business owner who stopped by the city market one, one morning, one morning early. And it was there that he hired uh, a bunch of workers for the day to work in his vineyard. And he agreed to pay them what would be a fair day's wage for a whole day's work. And so we hired a, a bunch of workers the, at early in the morning, and then a few hours later, as the story goes, he went back again and hired some more workers, and then he went again and hired some more workers. In fact, as Jesus told it, the owner of the vineyard hired more workers right up until quitting time. In fact, the last workers were hired just one hour before sunset. Now, as the sunlight began to fade, all of the workers lined up to receive their pay. And they lined up in the order from the last ones hired back to those who were hired early in the morning. And then this is where Jesus inserts a shocking detail into the story. Every worker, even those who were hired only an hour ago, they had only worked one hour. Every worker received a full day's wage. Now, it will not surprise you to hear that the things got tense when all of the workers who were there all day found out that everyone was getting the same pay. In fact, they rebelled. And they said to the vineyard owner, hey, we did most of the work. You're treating us unfairly. We deserve more. And then Jesus puts these words into the mouth of the vineyard owner. He says, didn't we agree on what I would pay you? I've kept my word. Why are you envious that I am generous? What does it matter to you if for my own reasons, I want to do something unexpected, something crazy, something that would make these workers run home to their families and say, you're not going to believe what happened to me today. And then that concludes the parable that Jesus told. That's the end of the first story. I want you to hang on to those details in your mind. Here's the second story. This is a true story that took place in Hannibal LaGrange University in Missouri in 2002, it was final exam day, and Denise Banderman walked into the classroom, and she got there before the professor arrived. There were other students there, all focused on last-minute cramming for the exam, of course. Then the professor enters, and he takes a few minutes, as they usually do, to review some of the material. Most of it was familiar, but there were some things that no one had remembered hearing during the class. And the professor responded to their questions. Hey, this is in your textbook. You're responsible for all the content on the exam. And this sent chills up the spine of all of those who were in the class. The time came for the test. And on cue, they all picked up their pens and flipped over their exams. And I want you to hear from Denise's own words what happened next. I couldn't believe it, she says. To my astonishment, every answer on the test was already filled in, and my name was written on the exam in red ink. Now, the confusion there traveled like a wave across the class as each student looked at their completed final exam. On the bottom of the last page of every test was a note from the professor 
It said this, all the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam for reasons. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took the test for you. All the work you did in preparation for the test did not help you get an A. Now, that concludes the second story. Now, I want you to think about these two stories. The vineyard workers who were paid a full day's wage for only one hour's work and the already completed final exam that gave every student an undeserved A. What do these two stories have in common? While you're thinking, let me tell you what they don't have in common. This does not mean at the end of this service you're getting a full day's wage pay. <laughs> don't have any illusion that's, that that's going to happen. It also doesn't mean that it's a waste of time to study for an exam, okay? That's not what it means. But what do these two stories actually have in common? Anybody have an idea? Just shout it out. Grace, what else? Generosity, what else? Kindness, what else? Some people would be envious, yes. Here's it. Here are... Here, here is what these two stories have in common. Extraordinary goodness, remarkable generosity, and extreme grace. The truth is, there isn't a single person in this room right now who hasn't experienced out lavish, or rather I should say outrageous, lavish, unexpected, and undeserved goodness. What's more... We experience goodness every single day. Goodness is poured out on us constantly. And how do I know this? How do I know that we experience goodness and that goodness is poured out on us constantly? How do I know this? Because I'm confident in this one unchanging eternal truth that permeates all of scripture and all of reality. And it's this. God is extravagantly good. Amen. Amen? God is extravagantly good. Even when we face overwhelming odds or unexpected setbacks in our life or unexplainable tragedy or inexplicable heartbreak, it's still true, even in those moments, that God is extravagantly good. And I don't know all the details of your life or all the problems that you face in life, but one thing I do know is God's goodness permeates your whole life. So we're in a series called um, Analog Christian, and over the last six weeks or so, we've been exploring the New Testament passage found in the book of Galatians, chapter 22. It's referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. We all know that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And our goal over these last couple of weeks have been to recognize these qualities, develop these qualities, and then model all nine of these spiritual qualities in a digital world, a world that's bent on keeping us plugged in and stressed out and fast-paced and self-absorbed and worldly focused and constantly distracted from the goodness of God. And so today, we're going to dive deep into the goodness of God. And what's fascinating about this Greek word that Paul uses here for goodness is that it's a rare word. It's actually only used four times in the New Testament in this particular variation. But it comes from a root word that Jesus used many times. And it means more than just goodness. In fact, it also carries the added meaning of generosity. In fact, this is the word that Jesus uses in the parable of the vineyard. When he quotes the vineyard owner saying to those who are upset about the pay situation, are you envious that I am generous? That word generous, that's the same word in the Greek that Paul uses in the fruit of the spirit where it's translated goodness. So the word can mean goodness or the word can mean generous. Here's the point. Goodness from God's perspective, always includes an element of generosity. Anytime God is good, he is being generous. Any generosity that you have in your life comes from a God who is being 
good. Because goodness is an attitude of the heart. It's expressed as an act of graciousness toward someone else. Even when, and I would say especially when, they don't deserve it or haven't earned it. If you want to see God for who he really is, here's a good starting point. Give thanks to the Lord for he is Taste and see that the Lord is good. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. And his love is eternal and his faithfulness endures to all generations. The Lord is good. to all people. That's what we need to realize. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And I love this last passage because it talks about Jesus himself. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for his sheep. There is no act in all of history that is better than that act right there. The goodness of God displayed in Jesus giving his life for you and I. In the Old Testament, Moses begged God. He said, please show me your glory. He wanted to see God in in all of his fullness. God, show me your glory glory in all of your fullness. I want to see you. And he wanted to see God for who he really is. And so it's kind of like he's saying, God, show me as much as I can take. Give me all I can stand. So what did God show him? Exodus 33, 19 gives us God's response. He says, I will cause all my goodness, not my power, not my wisdom, not my strength, all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name Yahweh before you. And this means that God's goodness is the ultimate expression of God's glory. That's kind of mind-blowing in some ways, that God's goodness is the ultimate expression of who he is. In fact, if you read on in that passage, it says, the Bible says that Moses' face literally glowed, like it literally glowed from his encounter with God meaning that goodness may be more powerful than we first imagined. He saw the goodness of God. He experienced the goodness of God, and that goodness caused his face to glow and to shine. There's a popular song on Z88.3 radio right now, and I don't know the name of the song, but some of the lyrics of the song go like this. God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. You've heard that phrase, right? Christians in Africa use this phrase a lot, and they repeat it in their worship gatherings. They even use it as greetings on the street when they see one another. But the truth is, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. And the question I have when I hear that phrase, and maybe you have the same question, is, is that really true, that God is good all the time? And the answer to that question would be, from a scriptural perspective, absolutely yes. And here's why. Goodness finds its source and definition in God alone. God is the very definition of goodness. All goodness finds its source in God. Goodness is an unchanging, immutable attribute of God. It's defined by God because he is the source of all that is good in this world. And what's more, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of those, all of the goodness that is in you is a direct reflection of the goodness and the glory of God. You may not shine like Moses, (laughs) but everything that's good in your life is a reflection of the glory of God. So back to the parable of the vineyard owner. How do you actually feel about those who worked only for one hour and got full pay? Somebody here earlier said envious, right? How do you feel about those who worked for one hour, but they got a full day's wage? Is that fair to the ones who worked all day and got the full day's wage? I used to work at Walt Disney World, the Magic Kingdom back in the day, and I was on the night shift, 11 to 7. Ooh, that was a rough one. And um, there were a few of my coworkers who would sneak off and find a place to hide and sleep um, for a couple hours in the middle of the night. And it's easy to do, lots of places to go. And all of a sudden, they'd show up like, whoo, I've been working hard. But the truth is, they've been napping on Tom Sawyer's Island. (laughs) That's the truth. 
And in my heart, I would hear that and I would think to myself, man, I deserve so much more than that person. I begin to get frustrated because I was working harder. I was working longer for the same pay. And I begin to think this is not fair. But here's what Jesus is saying in the parable. The owner of the vineyard has the right, has the prerogative to do what he wants with his own money. And so if he feels like being generous, nothing's stopping him from being good to those who are less deserving. He knows they have families to feed like we all do. He has bills, they have bills to pay. They have debts to clear. He chooses to be good. He doesn't have to be good. He chooses to be good, to give them what they need, even though they don't deserve it, even though they haven't earned it. So let me ask you, who in this parable is represented by the vineyard owner? Who is that in this parable? And the answer would be the vineyard owner represents God. And what Jesus is telling us is this, God's goodness is more than fair. God's goodness is more than fair. Some of us, someone look at the, that parable and go, well, that's not fair. No, it's more than fair. We're conditioned, most of us, from childhood to seek fairness and to seek uh, res uh, respect fairness and respect, uh, um, seek fairness and respect fairness. There, I said it. <laughs> And almost everyone develops a fairness mentality to some degree. We know what it means to deserve and not deserve something. Very early in life, kids learn to say, that's not fair. And most of the world, including those within the church, would try to apply the fairness mentality to salvation itself. And the assumption is that only those who are good enough, those who work long enough, go to heaven. Or find salvation. And so if you ask people this question, what do you think your chances are of going to heaven? You get answers that fall in line with the fairness approach. And you get answers like this. Well, it, it's 50-50. The older I get, the more I think my chances will improve. And, or you get answers like this. My chances are kind of slim. Maybe 50-50. You know, you have to be more than a nice person, but I'm still in the running. Someone else might say, 85%. I don't think the entrance exam will be that tough. <laughs> Here's the problem with all of those answers. All of those people are making a false assumption. They believe being saved works something like a balance scale. Where my sins are on one side of the scale and my good deeds are on the other side of the scale. And many believe that if my good deeds outweigh my sins, well, then I deserve to go to heaven. I'm good. Everything will work out the way I want it to. But that's not true. And here's why. The fairness approach does not apply to salvation. James chapter 2, verse 10 says this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, he has, been guilt, he has become guilty of all. Meaning, just one sin disqualifies you from ever earning or deserving salvation. <clears throat> so look at this next image of the balance scale here. You see, the only way to deserve heaven is to be perfect. 100% good, 100% of the time. 85% is not going to work. 50% is not even close. To go to heaven by the balance scale approach, you will have to live a perfect life. So the only balance scale judgment that really works is this one. All my sins go on one side of the scale, and Jesus' sacrifice goes on the other side of the scale. Only Jesus' death outweighs my sins, and that's not fair, my friends. That's grace, and it's good. So here's the deal. When it comes to salvation, forget about fairness. If you want God to be fair with you, you're not going to like the results. Because you're going to get what you deserve. But if you really want to go to heaven, rather than fairness, you must think in terms of grace. And we must get this through our heads. Grace is the opposite of fairness. 
Grace is the opposite of what we deserve. It's the opposite of fairness. Grace means that we will get the very opposite of what we deserve. And how good is that? Now, in most matters of the world, fairness is definitely a virtue. Children should be taught to be fair, play fair, and share fairly. We expect our courts to uh, apply justice and fairness. We believe in an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. But when it comes to salvation, we must stop thinking in terms of fairness and start thinking in terms of grace and goodness. The usual definition at Sunday school, the Sunday school definition of grace is unmerited favor. That's pretty common. That's, that's the usual definition of grace. It's, it's undeserved or unmerited favor from God. And this is okay. It's an okay definition. But it actually doesn't go far enough. God's gift of salvation to a sinner is not just unmerited or undeserved. It's actually the opposite of what the sinner deserves. This is a better definition. Grace is actually favor bestowed when wrath is owed. Favor bestowed, that's the, that's the goodness, that's the gift, when actually wrath is what we deserve. So let's go back to the parable of the vineyard for just a moment. Since the vineyard owner represents God, who do you think all these workers represent? Us. We are the ones who are undeserving, having not met the standard required for full payment, whether you've worked all day or whether you've only worked during the last hour. You haven't met the standard. And yet... God chooses to pay the debt we owe him by pouring his wrath on Jesus instead of us. God is extravagantly good, giving us freely what we do not deserve, all of us. The one thing we can never earn but desperately need, forgiveness, God offers it to us freely through Jesus. I love this verse, one of my favorite verses. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, meaning Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds, by his death, it means, by his stripes, by his sacrifice, by the cross, you have been healed. What's more, we could ask God, what more could we ask for God or from God? A God who is generous beyond belief and good to us, even though we've done nothing to deserve his goodness, what more could we ask than he be good to us? And this is the one thing that is for sure. God's goodness means he is more than fair to you and I and to everyone who puts their faith and hope and trust in him. A few years ago, the British government launched a public awareness campaign. Uh, it was about the importance of including more fruit and vegetables in, their, in your diet. <clears throat> and uh, their goal was to promote what the recommendations of the World Health Organization are, which are to eat at least five servings of fruit and vegetables every day. And so they called the campaign Five a Day. That's their logo. And I think it's even still ongoing. Um, and so, you know, you would go into a grocery store or whatever, and it'd say, have you had your five a day? You meet somebody on the street. Have you had your five a day? Whatever. They were trying to promote a healthier diet. Well, it wasn't long before a Christian organization in the UK jumped on this idea and launched their own campaign, a spiritual diet made up of the fruit of the spirit. And they called it nine a day, <laughs> uh, becoming like Jesus, nine a day, becoming like Jesus. And their inspiration for their nine a day becoming like Jesus campaign came from a pastor who was also a scholar named John Stott. Maybe you have heard of him. And every morning, this was John Stott's prayer. He prayed, Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence and please you more and more. Jesus, Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day I, you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. What a prayer. Some say, actually, that John Stott was the most Christ-like person they ever met. I don't know if that's true, but that's what some people say. Imagine the transformation in your own life 
if that was your daily prayer, the prayer he prayed was the prayer you prayed and you actually meant it. It wasn't just words on a screen or words on a page, but you actually meant that prayer. If you prayed that prayer every day for God to ripen his fruit in your life, do you think God would answer that prayer? You better believe he would. I can think of no better prayer, in fact, to to accelerate your spiritual maturity than asking God to develop in your heart the fruit of the Spirit. And my challenge to you is to begin praying that bold prayer every single day. Maybe you need to take a screenshot of it if that's possible so that you have the words because bold prayers honor God and God honors bold prayers. Get bold as you ask God to help you grow all of the fruit of the Spirit, including goodness into your life. Then show your love for God by being good and by being gracious toward other people. The same way God's been gracious and good towards you even when you don't deserve it, even when you haven't earned it. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we need to be good towards other people. It says this, you're never more like God than when you're expressing the goodness of God toward others. You are never more like God than when you are expressing goodness toward other people because that's exactly what God does towards you, whether you deserve it or you don't. So I want to tell you a story about a, man, a, a, a young man named John Gilbert. He only lived to the age of uh, 25. He was five years old when he was diagnosed with a rare form of muscular dystrophy. True story. A genetic, progressive, debilitating disease. And it would claim his life some 20 years later, but not before subtracting everything from him. Every year, John Gilbert lost something. In time, he lost his ability to do all the normal things that we take for granted, even his ability to speak. But there was this one moment that stood out in his life. It happened when he was invited to the National Football League's fundraising auction. When it began, one particular item caught John's eye. It was a basketball signed by all the players of the Sacramento Kings. John so desperately wanted that ball. And so when it came up for bid, he raised his hand up in the air and his mother quickly grabbed his hand and brought it back down knowing that they didn't have the money to bid on an item like that. The bidding on the basketball continued and with great excitement amongst the crowd, it rose to an astounding amount compared to some of the other items at the auction. Finally, a man made a bid that no one could possibly match. A man walked to the front of the room and he claimed uh, his prize, the basketball, but instead of going back to his seat, he walked across the room and he gently placed it into the small hands of a boy who would never dribble a basketball down a court, who would never throw it to a teammate, never shoot it from the foul line, but would cherish this gift as long as he lived. John Gilbert, while he was still able wrote these words. He said, it took me a moment to realize what the man had done. I remember hearing gasps all around the room and a thunderous applause and weeping eyes. And to this day, I'm amazed. Have you ever been given a gift that you could not have gotten by yourself? Has anyone ever sacrificed a huge amount for you without getting anything in return, he says. When we think about those questions that he asks there, the answer to that would have to be yes, everyone in this room has been given a gift that is so great and so grand that it's almost incomprehensible. God's goodness has been given to us in such a way that if we accept it, if we allow it to come into our lives, it will literally transform our lives. How do I know this is true? Because I believe the scripture that says, for God so loved the world that he is one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And when I think about that verse, I say to myself, how good is that? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for just this moment that we can sit back and comprehend just how good you are, that your goodness reflects your glory and reveals that 
You're an amazing God who is a gracious God who doesn't require us to be perfect because there's no way we can. But in spite of the fact that we fall short in many ways, you still give us the richest and the greatest gift, the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ, whose death on the cross enables it to happen, who enables us to be forgiven by you when we put our trust and our hope in him. Thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Thank you for letting us today just get us a, a glimpse of your glory. Not as much as Moses had, of course, but we get a little glimpse of your glory as we think about who you are and the goodness that comes from you and only you. And we're in awe. May we take that goodness from you, internalize it, and share it with the rest of the world. It's in Christ's name we pray.